Okay. That version of that song, I swear, made um, listening to Baby Shark no less than 7,000 times <laughs> my kids were little. It made it bearable. Um, follow me for more parenting tips. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome. This is the Full Circle uh, Orientation Webinar for Pregnancy. I am your host, Dr. Adams. Um, some of you, we just did your history not too long ago, a little earlier today. Some of you I saw yesterday and some I'm going to see tomorrow and maybe um, the day after for your history. Uh, if you're able to see my host screen, please raise your hand. And Okay, I see hands going up. So that means we are good to go ahead and get started. Um, go grab a pencil, grab a pen, grab your notebook. Um Anything you need to take notes because we have a lot of stuff that we're going to go over. So let's go ahead and jump into it. All right. A couple of housekeeping things first. One, this is confidential. So you see how you raised your hand and you can tell who else was raising their hand. I can see who's raising their hand, uh, but nobody else can. So please feel free to ask any question that's on your mind, the subject on the screen. No one will be able to tell that it was you. And I will answer the questions in such a way that no one will know that it was you. If I think it's something that may, like, that's a little too personal, people may be able to feel, figure out who you are. I might say, let's bring that question to your visit later on. So it is confidential. Please ask me questions in real time. I hate when it's just me talking. Um, participate. Please answer the poll questions. I have some poll questions sprinkled throughout here and there to just make sure we're staying engaged. And then um, if you registered for this, you will receive a link afterward to watch it later on on our YouTube channel, and it will be available for the duration of your pregnancy. So let's get started with the poll question first. Let's find out who's on the line. How many first-time mamas and how many veteran mamas do I have on the line? So this is an example of how the polls will work. We'll put the questions up. You'll answer the questions. I'll talk kind of bluff for 20 seconds or so, and then I will say the polls are closed. Boom. Oh, we have the first time moms heavily outweighing the mommy veterans this time and probably some first time dads on the line too. Hey, daddies. All right. So this helps me to tailor what I say next. Um, so please um, stay engaged with the questions because there are a couple of different choose your own adventure ways this can go. Um, so but the things that we are going to touch on today, topics we're going to hit will be the full circle experience, where we deliver, office protocols, pregnancy visits, what to expect at each one of those. We'll give you some prenatal resources, go over exercise and nutrition and pregnancy, and finally um, hit a COVID-19 update. Okay, <clears throat> so first thing is the full circle philosophy. We are a collaborative midwifery model practice, which operates under the premise that pregnancy and birth are normal life processes. This is not a disease you have contracted and now we have to cure you. This is a normal process that is necessary for the maintenance of human life on this planet. The traditional midwifery model cares for normal low-risk women. Um, however, it's just midwives. And so if they identify any problem, you might have to transfer out from their care for a different acuity to be able to get physician input. In the collaborative model though, um, you are able to stay in the care of the midwives with physician direction. So if you develop an issue with your pregnancy that requires physician consultation, you've already got it. It's already built in. Um, the, the midwives and the physicians meet every two weeks to run the list of who's pregnant. And then we make plans for any um, for any situation that, that comes up. So if you're getting a plan of care and direction from the midwife, um, if it is a pregnancy complication or a pregnancy issue, the plan of care came from the physicians. You can also sometimes make appointments with the physicians too, but you're going to hear the same thing that you heard from the midwives because we all talk about you behind your backs all the time. Um, to that end, the reason that we want you to continue seeing the midwives for your prenatal care, though, is that most of the labors and deliveries are attended by our certified nurse midwives because the people who are experts in the physiologic normal labor of the woman in care of the newborn infant are the midwives. Um, and most of you are coming to us because you're looking to get a vaginal delivery and your highest chance of doing that is with a midwife after having the collaborative care of a physician, making sure that we get to that point where you're a safe and good candidate for that vaginal delivery. Now, if there are emergencies, um, both of the hospitals uh, that we attend currently have um, 
emergency have hospitalists, board certified OBGYNs who are on staff 24 hours a day. So if there is a true emergency, like your baby needs to be out in five minutes, cannot wait. There is somebody in house, in house all the time who's able to do that. Most things are not emergencies. Sometimes though, things are urgent. Like they can't wait until tomorrow. Like if your baby is saying, I don't want to come out this way. I need somebody else to get me out a different way. Um, then the midwives will call one of the full circle physicians and we will be there. All of us live about 20 minutes from the hospital and we will be there to help take care of your little one. To put it in perspective, true emergencies. Last year we did almost 540 deliveries. Only two of them um, required uh, the consultation of the hospitalists and they still ended up being full circle deliveries. So it's not likely that that's going to be you. All right. Where do we deliver? Um, our primary hospital coming up in uh, toward the end of the month, actually, will be HCA Florida Memorial Hospital, which is about a nine minute drive from our office. Um, it, they do have one to one tours which are available. We have the information in the hospital in, in the office. I'm sorry. And our um, our office manager has the phone number. You can call the um call the Director of Women's Services and she will arrange a one-on-one -on -one tour um, on evenings, on weekends, whatever is available to accommodate you and your schedule so that you can see the facility. Um, we are transitioning out of Ascension St. Vincent Southside Hospital, uh, which is um, also close to the office, probably more like a five minute with, uh, with, with the lights. Um, they don't have in-house tours right now. Um, they do have an online tour that is available and there is a link. I don't think anyone who's on the line now, though, will be delivering uh, before October 30th, so you will not need to take a tour at Ascension St. Vincent's. We do have a town hall to discuss why we are changing hospitals. We've been at Ascension for the last nine years, and this is a big change for our practice. And the major question is why? Why are you doing this? And I'm going to answer that question in the town hall next Friday. So I encourage you, there's a QR code that's up right now. Please scan it, register to attend. It's next Friday at 3 p.m. It will be recorded, but please try to attend it um, live so that you can ask your questions live. Um, it will also be attended by the administration at, at Memorial, uh, the chief nursing officer and the senior vice president of operations. Y'all, they are excited to get us. And when I tell you the things that they have put in place um, to get us to come over, um, you're going to be excited as well. All right. So I'll give you a second to scan that and then we move on. Okay, how to contact us. Our office is open Monday through Thursday, nine to one. We close for lunch from one to two, and then we reopen at two and are open until five. So if you call the office between one and two, please know that you will get the, you reach the after hours line. It's not really after hours and the phone isn't really broken. Um, so don't, don't freak out. Uh, we, we rolled it to the after hours line so that if it's an emergency, you can still reach the on-call provider, but please don't, press zero to reach the on-call provider if you just want to reschedule your appointment because one, she can't do that. And two, that's not an emergency. Just, just call her back. Just call us back after two o'clock. Um, or I think you're able to leave a voicemail also. Um, if it's some uh, administrative issue that you needed to reach the front desk for. On Friday, we're open from 9 to 1. And uh, so if you are calling at 1253 with a non-urgent issue, um, then that may be returned when we open back up on Monday at 9 a.m. We're happy to serve you then. Those are our business days. We're not open on Saturdays or Sundays. Um, appointments, the office isn't open, but we'll talk about who's on call for the practice. Uh, for appointments, we typically do not have walk-in appointments. Um, if our, our goal here is, for those of you who have been here, you know our goal is to see you as close to your appointment time as possible. Therefore, we promise you a time and we try to see you at that time. We can't do that if someone is walking in saying, I just realized I have a problem and I need to be seen at three o'clock. I've already given the three o'clock slot to somebody. So we may have some limited same day appointments. Occasionally there are people who deliver and spaces clear up on the midwife schedules and we can get you in with them on the same day. If, however, you are calling us, say, at nine in the morning and you say, I have this problem, I need to be seen, and we look and our first available slot is not until three o'clock, and we say, hey, this is actually more urgent than that. You need to go to an urgent care or you need to go over to the hospital to be seen for, for triage. That is not us saying, we don't care about you. We don't want to see you. It's us agreeing with you. Yes, we think your matter is urgent and it requires an urgent care setting. So. We don't want you to come and sit in the office and wait for five hours to be worked on somebody's schedule. We want to see you ASAP in an urgent care setting. 
Sorry. Okay, next. Phone calls. If you make a phone call, um, providers are not able to leave a patient appointment to take a phone call. So again, this goes to respecting your time. If you booked a time to see me or one of my providers, um, she and I are going to give you our undivided attention during that time. You would not want for us to leave your appointment to go talk to someone else as if her problem is more important than yours. So please show the same respect. Um, we do have an amazing triage nurse, Tony, who will take your messages. Uh, there are certain things that she is able to triage uh, because there are frequently the same complaints from, from, from pregnant women are, 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 are repetitive and she has um, a script for those. If it's something that's outside of her scope, outside of her script, she knows how to contact the on-call provider to get an answer from one of us for you. Um, if you're calling and you're transferred to her line and she's on the line with another patient, you might have to leave a message. She is taking those messages down and she is calling people back and giving them answers. So if you see phone calls from full circle after you know you've left a message, please answer the phone um, because she wants to answer and respond to your concerns. You do have to leave a message to receive a call back though. You can't just call and hang up and call and hang up and call and hang up because we do not just call back people off of caller ID because you'd be surprised how many people pocket dial their gynecologist. And so we don't just call back. So who do you contact for, for what? Um, for pregnancy administration things, um, it is actually Tony. Uh, Tony is the new Stacy, like Orange is the new Black. And Tony is in charge of letters and forms like FMLA paperwork, short-term disability paperwork, and triage phone calls, as I just mentioned. We have an OB clinical coordinator. Most of you have heard from her at least once. Um, she's the one who sent out your cute little baby pictures, and she also sends out your prenatal labs. She does our referrals if you need to see a high-risk doctor, cardiologist, physical therapist, that sort of thing. Um, she sends you your blood work, and if you need something scheduled at the end of pregnancy or at any point during pregnancy, like steroid shots, injection, C-section, and Naisha is the one who coordinates that with the hospital for you as well. If you have any insurance concerns, many of you, everyone on this call should have already met Renee Hall. Um, so if your insurance changes, again, um, this crew is going to be pregnant over the holidays. So if your insurance is going to change in January, please, please, please make sure you reach out to Renee Hall and let her know so that she can look for your new maternity benefits and make sure that we're up to date and not collecting if we no longer need to collect because your insurance has, has changed. And if there's anything you don't understand about your insurance or your prepayment plans, Renee is also the person to request when you call. All right. After hours, there is always somebody on call from our practice for our practice. The emergency on call provider line is for, I think I need to go to the hospital. This is not, man, I totally forgot everything Jane said at my visit. Can you look at my chart and just see what she said? That's not what the emergency line is for, because this is the person who is also at the hospital catching babies. So, also, you must leave a voicemail to receive a call back. The phone doesn't even register that a call comes through unless you leave a message stating that you require a call back. Um, you'll hear on the message, uh, if you don't get a call back in 20 minutes, please call back. And then if you don't get a call back, um, then proceed to the hospital. So don't just sit at home if you have an emergency. Don't have your baby on the kitchen floor because nobody ever called you back, y'all. If you need to go to the hospital, please go to the hospital because also remember the person who is supposed to be calling you back may be in a room pushing with, with somebody and may not have the opportunity to stop that and give you a call back. And so you'll probably just see her at the hospital. The other way to contact us is the patient portal. Uh, remember that response times can take up to two business days. So this is not a, I think I need to go to the hospital situation. Do not send us messages like that over the patient portal. The next, I'm sorry, I think I think I have a lag in my internet right now. So I'm not seeing the things pop up um, as quickly as you all are. If there's a non-action item that you're sending to the patient portal, um, we may turf it to the person who's going to see you. If you have a visit tomorrow or in two days, remember you have two days to get a a response on the patient portal. So we may just send it to the person who's going to see you in one or two days because you'll probably get your answer faster from her at your actual appointment. And then 
Sorry, guys, <laughs> it's, we're having a thing. Um, also, things like losing your, your lab slip. Um, we can send you another lab slip if we know that it's gone. Like, say you need to get your labs done before you come back to your next visit. Um, so we can send you a new one. Or say you have COVID and you have an appointment coming up in five days. Uh, you need to cancel your appointment. That's something that you can send over the patient portal. And you know you can directly reach the front desk by sending appointment request messages for things like needing to cancel your appointment instead of reaching out to the providers directly. Things that we do not want to see on the patient portal. Urgent matters such as, oh, my blood pressure is super high. I'm not feeling my baby move. I'm bleeding really heavily. My blood runs cold. When I see those messages have been sitting out there for more than 24 hours and nobody's done anything about them. So please, that is a phone call. That is not a portal message. Please don't send those things over the patient portal. Those are urgent matters. Um, also, don't send blitz messages. So if you've sent a message to me and it has not been two business days, please do not send the same message to Lauren, to Dr. Mero, to Dr. Mooney, to Jane, to Don, and say, I don't know who's on call, so I'm going to send it to everybody. Um, one, that is portal abuse. And two, multiple messages to one or different providers within a short period of time um, shows up as blitz messaging, and it messes up the system. Like They think that you're a bot trying to spam the system, and it will shut down your portal completely. And trying to get Athena to reinstate your portal is no easy task task. So please do not abuse the portal. Send one message, wait two business days. And then if you still have not um, heard something, we do have a couple of part-time midwives. You may need to send it to one of the full-time midwives um, who would be more apt to check it um, to, within two business days. Also, please don't attempt to have your appointment via the patient portal. If you have questions, text them to yourself. We'll talk about, talk about that in a minute or schedule an appointment. Be like, oh, you know, I've had this rash and I was reading. I think this might be it. Here's some pictures. What do you think? I also did some research. What medications can you prescribe? That's a visit. Like we really need to see you, examine you, take a full history and treat you as appropriate. So please give us a call and schedule an appointment for that. And if you send those types of messages, we will sometimes forward them to the front desk and say, hey, I really need to see her. So just reach out to her to get her scheduled. All right. Um, Ultrasounds are also sent out over the patient portal. So if there is something urgently abnormal on your ultrasound, we will not let you leave. We won't let you leave the building until someone has been pulled out of their schedule. This is one of the rare occasions that we will get off of schedule. Um, our sonographers are great. They know which things shouldn't walk out of the out of the door without a plan. And so they'll come get one of us and we'll talk to you. Um, but otherwise, the results from the ultrasound are downloaded from the computer, uploaded into our EMR assigned to providers, and then give us a chance to receive them, review them, and respond. Sometimes you'll see Taylor or Kathleen just kind of typing away on their uh, machine, and you think, oh my gosh, what's she typing? Something's wrong with my baby. And you go out and you want to send a portal message, what's on my ultrasound? Um, or there's some issue that we're following, has my placenta moved? You know, what's my baby's weight? That sort of thing. I don't know yet because it hasn't been two business days. But when we get the reports, we will review them and we do release them to the the portal in a timely fashion, along with any instruction. Typically, they'll tell you if you need to have a follow-up um, appointment then, and then we'll tell you, go into detail why. If you know you're the type of person who cannot wait two business days, please try to make an appointment the same day as your ultrasound so that you can go over it with, with the midwife instead of waiting for the, um, for, for the portal message. Quest also has a portal. It's super annoying because they send results to you before they send them to me. And then you see the results and you see that there's red on it and it freaks you out because red is bad, right? No, red doesn't necessarily mean that it is abnormal. Remember that the labs, the reference ranges that they're using are for non-pregnant people. Pregnancy causes physiologic changes, which can change the parameters of your labs and still be normal. So give us a chance to receive the labs, review them and release them to you on the portal. Please don't upload your labs to the portal and say, I found this on my quest portal. Can you tell me is what's wrong? No, because I'm going to get the labs in about two days from quest and I'm going to review them and I'm going to send them to you. And I may not remember that I already got them from you and reviewed them and sent them to you. So please don't make double work for, for us, please. I promise we, we will receive them and review them. Now, if you've had your results for over a week and you still haven't heard from us about them, maybe quest didn't send them to us. And so in that case, please, um, reach out and say, have, hey, have you guys gotten my quest results? Because I did get my labs done. So in those cases, we're happy to take a look at them. Any questions about reaching to, um, out to us? Lots of different ways to communicate with us. 
and the best ways to engage us. Okay, cool. I think we move on to what to expect for your prenatal visits next. Yes, prenatal visits. Remember that part where I said text yourself questions? Y'all, pregnancy brain is real and you are gonna have so many questions when you walk out of this building. And then when you walk back into this building, it's like we're like infusing some amnesia inducing agent because when you sit down in those exam rooms, you don't remember anything you had to ask us. Start a thread with yourself uh, with all your pregnancy questions or bring a little notebook. I love when y'all have these little journals. Those are so cute. Um, and ask us all the questions because by the time you come in, we check your blood pressure, we listen to baby and all that stuff. And then all the questions fly out of your brain. Please wear loose, comfortable clothing so we can access your bellies. I think we're getting out of romper season. That's probably the most um, difficult, but we're getting into overall season and the overalls are coming back too. Those are hard. We, you know, we come in and you're trying to get out of your overall and we just need to get to your belly. So a shirt that you can pull up or shorts that you can pull down under the belly so we can just take a quick listen to baby's heartbeat. Um, measure your belly, see which direction baby is, is facing. We want to get to that belly. Um, please arrive a minimum of five minutes before your scheduled appointment time. That'll give you enough time to check in, handle any insurance issues. Um, leave a urine sample if you need to. We're not routinely collecting urine on everyone. ACOG says we no longer need to do that. So if you were recently treated for urinary tract infection, we'll be asking you for a sample. Um, if we're following you for blood sugar or blood protein or urine protein, uh, then we may need a urine sample. Otherwise, we know you're pregnant, you've been driving, you've been drinking drinking your water, drink your water. And um, when you get in, you have to go to the bathroom. So please come on in and go to the bathroom. That's fine. Question we have out here. Uh, do you guys use LabCorp 2 or just Quest? We primarily use Quest, but we're happy to send things to LabCorp. Just let us know if, if you prefer LabCorp and we're, we'll happily send it over there. Actually prefer LabCorp in terms of they're sending things back. If you're 10 minutes late for your visit, um, that is the end of our grace period. We will still have time to check on you and your baby, but at least little questions, at least little time for, for your questions. If you're 20 minutes late, that is the entire appointment time. Anything between 10 and 20 minutes is kind of up to the grace of the, of the midwife. If you're later in pregnancy, we'll at least try to get a, a, a blood pressure check on you to make sure that, that you're okay. Um, but 20 minutes late, you missed the whole appointment slot. Front desk is really good about recognizing when people are coming in late because we know traffic happens, other kids happen. Anytime you want to put them in the car, they, they mess up their, their diapers. I understand. I've been there. But if you missed the whole appointment, they're really good about looking and seeing, ah, she missed that whole appointment with Dawn. Let me slide her over here into this appointment with, with Missy. And so they'll have you rescheduled as you're walking in the door. If the time that they tell you, you know, you were 320, I have a four o'clock. If you can't wait for the four o'clock, just let them know. Um, we can always reschedule to a time that works better for both of us, but they're definitely going to try their best to get you in on the same day if you're just coming in completely after your whole appointment time. Because we want to see you. We do. Diagnostic ultrasound visit. So a question that I get is when should I bring my significant other or my family to my visit because they want to see the baby. Um, so diagnostic ultrasound visits are separate from prenatal visits. So there is a way to know if ultrasounds are coming up because we do not routinely do them at every single visit. Sometimes for twins, when you're early on and it's hard to separate one heart from the other, we, we will. But for normal singleton pregnancies, we know we're not typically doing ultrasounds every single time. The way to know if you're, have one, if you're having an ultrasound do you have more than one appointment time? And do you have a provider's name associated with your visit? So for example, when you log into your portal, what you should be able to see is your upcoming appointments. This is Tina Test. She is our imaginary patient. And Tina logs into the portal. We're not violating her HIPAA because she's imaginary. She clicks on her appointment tab. And she sees that she has two appointments scheduled on the same day. So Tina has a 920 appointment with ultrasound. Ultrasound is not a provider's name. And so Tina has an ultrasound scheduled. And then at 10 o'clock, she has an appointment with Dr. Yeckel. Dr. Yeckel is a provider's name. So Tina has an ultrasound scheduled that day. If Tina does not see ultrasound on there, but she knows she's supposed to have one, Tina should call the office to ask to schedule an ultrasound so that she can have one done. 
that's how Tina knows that she has an ultrasound schedule and she can tell her family what, what time to be there and what time um, they can leave if they don't want to stick around for the visit. Remember again that those ultrasound results are going to be sent to the patient portal within two business days unless there is something urgently abnormal. If there is an urgent abnormal, we will not let you leave. That's a take home message. We won't let you leave the building until we discuss those results and give you those results as well. And the question you have for me is actually the same question that I have for you. The question out here says, how often will you have an, an ultrasound? Um, I'm going to answer that in just a moment. Please let the front desk know when you need a prenatal visit and a diagnostic ultrasound visit when due. So your provider is going to let you know when you have an ultrasound due. Um, if you're having an ultrasound and you don't have a provider visit on that same day, if you need another follow-up, like the ultrasonographers know if they didn't see everything they needed to see, they'll say come back in four weeks. Everybody here also has algorithms of what things we, we follow up. If we're following growth for a particular placental malformation, formation, for example, they know that it's every four to six weeks that, that they need to be following up and they'll write on the paper when you need to schedule another one. All right. Um, if you don't like our in our ultrasound interval and you want to see your baby more frequently, uh, there are boutique ultrasounds out there. So these are fun places that you can go. These are not diagnostic ultrasounds. These are fun ultrasounds. They are perfectly safe. Ultrasounds are not radi are not radiation. They are sound waves. So you can go to any of these places. There are a couple of other places too. I know there's one in St. Augustine. I can never think of the name of it, but these are just for informational purposes. It's a good starting point. There's some one of these in every area of the city. City, so not endorsing any one over the other. Um, but you can go there. They like will put the baby's heartbeat in the stuff, the animal, do 3D ultrasounds. It's super cute. So poll question. So turnabout is fair play. When should I expect a routine ultrasounds? So one of the answers we already know is not true <laughs> because I already said what we won't be doing. Um, so please vote. How many, when do you think? Are we doing them every single time we see you? Are we doing them at 20 and 40 weeks? Or are we doing them only if you have a problem? Remember the key word here is routine, routine. That means if everything is going well and the polls close in three, two, one, boom. All right, at 20 and 40 weeks. And that is the answer to your question out there. Yes. So at 20 weeks, we do your routine anatomy ultrasound. And again, that is if you have no other issues. So people who have other situations like previous preterm delivery, IVF pregnancy, previous cervical surgery, they'll have ultrasounds before that, but that's not routine. People who have no issues, low risk going into this, their first ultrasound will be around 20 weeks. If there's something we don't see on that ultrasound, we may do other ones to get all the rest of the views. That is also not routine. If everything is seen on that 20 week ultrasound, you will and you continue to measure normally good blood pressures, good blood sugar, you won't need another one until F if you go past your due date. That is routine. So hopefully that answered your question. Long drawn out answer to that. All right, we flipped over to our website. This is fullcirclejacks.com and you'll see the banner at the top of the screen on October 20th, the virtual town hall. All of you have already scanned that QR code to register for it. If you have not, please go to the website fullcirclejacks.com and you'll see the blue hyperlink there. Register here to attend this exciting event. And this was my moment of transparency. You get to ask me any questions about why we made the decision decision to change facilities after nearly a decade. Because you know there has to be a good reason. You guys know I do things for a reason. All right, what other information is out here? Let's start with the providers. So um, the providers, one of these lovely ladies will be lucky enough to help you usher your new little one or little ones into the world. Um, there is me, pre-COVID, more, more hair. Dr. Marrow, pre-COVID, less hair. <laughs> She's got more hair than that now. Dr. Yeckel, probably the same amount of hair. Dr. Mooney, also the same amount of hair. <laughs> then we have the midwives. We have midwife Lauren. There's midwife Krista. There's midwife Cindy. We have midwife Dawn. There's midwife Missy. And where's midwife Jane? There she is down there. Not sure why the computer dropped her down a bit down there at the bottom. Um, there we go. 
that, that looks better. <laughs> OK, awesome. So if you can click on those, you can see our, all of our bios. But really, the thing that you need to know the most is that everybody here is like minded in terms of our delivery philosophies um, and our respect for patient autonomy and the birth experience. We are birth geeks. This is our favorite thing to do. OK, over here under patient information, you click on the obstetric tab. And while we're doing that, I'll see if there is another um, question out here. Yes. Will a will will a replay be available? if unable to attend the town hall live? Yes, absolutely. It will be recorded and available for, for playback. Excellent question. Thank you. All right. So over here and hello, <laughs> um, over here under obstetrics information, uh, you will see lots of good stuff. Our delivery stats are out here um, back to 2018. We are very transparent. Many of you are here because of our delivery stats. You're either trying to avoid an unnecessary C-section and an unnecessary repeat cesarean um, or just looking for a safe home. And we've got that, too. So those are our stats um, dating back several years. Years, and we will be publishing our stats again in January because transparency. What to expect at each visit? So the prenatal care timeline. Um, while we open that up, I'll answer this next question. What is your opinion on baby Doppler devices you can buy online to listen to baby's heartbeat at home? You are going to make yourself crazy chasing that little baby around your tummy, especially if, if you're very early. It's like when you come to your visits and you see that we're like, oh, it's not there, it's not there. Remember the heart is like a couple millimeters big at a certain point and you're trying to chase it around your, your abdomen. It will make you go a little bit crazy looking for it. As baby gets bigger, the heart gets bigger and it gets easier to find. Mind, but it's still, if it's not something that you do every day, like, like we do, it's still not super easy to find and you'll make yourself a little crazy doing it. Um, I, I think it increases anxiety more than it gives reassurance. It's my two cents. <laughs> it's not dangerous though. I mean, if, if you want to do it, I, I just don't know that it will make you feel better. <laughs> All right, prenatal care timeline. So everyone on here has already done their confirmation visit. You hung out with Taylor and one of the midwives, hopefully had a great experience with, with them. Um, and then let's see, you talk to Renee Hall and you scan the QR code to visit me here. Then some of you have already had your history visits and some of, the, some of you have those coming up virtually with me. We'll have a one-on-one -on -one where we go over your medical history and if, and if applicable, your pregnancy history. And we'll order your routine prenatal labs. Again, transparency and ordering. So people come to me and they say, well, I really don't know what labs were already done. You will always know what labs are done here because we tell you right here, these are the labs that we're going to do. So your standard routine prenatal um, blood work has your blood type, your blood count, and some serologies. The STD screening that you see on here are um, recommendations by ACOG and requirements by Duval County Health Department to have these done at least once during pregnancy. Um, then let's see, your homework is to try to get that blood work done as soon as possible. Uh, some of you have opted in for genetic screening. Some of you have opted out. It's probably 50-50 who opts in or out. Uh, but we talk about that when I see you for your, for your history visit. Um, at this point in pregnancy, we're seeing you every four weeks. So about four weeks after your initial visit, you should be coming back to the office for your OB physical exam. And that is a regular physical. We listen to your heart. We listen to your lungs. We check your pelvis, um, all, all these good things. But if you're due for a pap test, you're welcome to get that done at that time too. But what we really need are the cervical cultures, which is part the end of the, of the screening test, which is from by ACOG and the Duval County Health Department. So that's the one time screening for STDs that needs to be done during pregnancy. If you have a high risk issue, this is usually if you haven't already received your referral from me when I saw you for your history visit, we'll make sure that your referral is in place to see the high risk doctors because they usually will see you for the first time around 12 to 13 weeks. About four weeks after that, you're going to come back into the office for your second trimester visit. We talk about normal physiologic changes, round ligament pain, feeling the baby move for the first time, which is so cool. And then four weeks later, you're back for that first ultrasound, your anatomy ultrasound around 20 weeks. This is where we check out the brain structures, the heart structures, the kidneys, all that good stuff. And if your baby's cooperative, this would be your first chance to see if it's boy or girl if you didn't do the prior genetic screening. If you're planning to get a flu shot, this is my flu season crew. Flu shots are okay in any trimester, so you can get those done anytime between October and March. Around your anatomy ultrasound, we'll also be doing a mental health screening. So the EPDS, you guys, you're a whole person. You're not just a uterus. 
Um, and so we have to make sure the whole person is doing well. Um, we talk a lot about postpartum feelings, but antepartum anxiety, antepartum depression are things as well. And we want to make sure that we're staying ahead of those things and being well overall. Um, if you're meeting with a midwife at the same time as your anatomy ultrasound, this is when we're going to start talking about childbirth education classes, breastfeeding classes, and that sort of thing. Then one more of those um, four-week visits, and we'll give you the uh, orders for your glucose test. I'm going to circle back to the glucose test, so please hold your questions about that. Um, my moms with a certain blood type will be checking to make sure there are no harmful antibodies in, in your blood and making sure that the medications that, that you require to protect baby, Rogam, for those of you who are Arch negative and had in a previous pregnancy, making sure that it's in place so you get it between 28 and 30 weeks. This is when you're going to schedule your hospital tour, select your doula if you plan to work with one, and we're going to talk about doulas in a little bit, and then complete and return your hospital pre-admission um, stuff, which is actually going to be online now at HCA rather than the paperwork that we had you doing before for Ascension. All right, as we scroll to the next page, I'm going to answer these next couple of questions. With the genetic screening, will they be taking all of the labs or do I need to just do the NIPT with them and then go to Quest for the routine labs? They'll do everything. If you're going up to First Coast Testing Services, they'll draw all of the blood work. They'll send the routine ones to Quest or whichever lab you, you designate and they'll send the other ones to Natera. The next question is, is there a mandatory referral to MFM if you're only AMA with no other complications? There is not because it is not abnormal to be 35 and up. It's not. That's natural. Our hope is that everybody becomes 35 and up at some point in their life, whether during pregnancy or not. That is normal. All right. So now we're kicking into the every two week visits and you will see at the 30 week here, it says option to decline or repeat prenatal labs. Again, it is um, a mandate to do it at least once during pregnancy. Uh, repeat is recommended if you are in a high risk population or have a high risk, a practice of high risk patients. If you feel that you are not a high risk person, we have a form here. Very simple. We'll send it to your to your phone. You can just click I decline to repeat them no stress on, on that, no, no stress and, and no judgment. Um, this is when we start talking about your Tdap. And again, those who your uh, your tetanus booster is your is your Tdap, and then those um, who haven't gotten flu shot and want to get it later on. My first time mommies, this is when you want to start looking around for your pediatrician because as much as I love you and your baby, once that baby is out, you gotta find somebody else to, to see that baby. Um, and we start seeing you every two weeks. So my moms who have any um, coexisting concerns with the pregnancy, like blood pressure or blood sugar, we start doing additional testing to make sure that we're not developing any more complications as a result of that. For my moms who are already anticipating that they're going to have a belly birth, which is our term for a cesarean delivery, um, we try to get those scheduled for you. We try to look for a date starting at 33 weeks so you can start to plan for, you know, family coming into town and that sort of thing. We continue with the every two week visits until about 36 weeks. At 36 weeks, there's another pelvic exam where we screen for group beta strep. This is not an infection. It is a normal bacteria that may have a risk for infection in babies. If you already declined repeating your STD screen in third trimester, you're also declining the repeat gonorrhea chlamydia swabs. After this week, you're going to start seeing us weekly. This is when it gets real. Um, you're going to bring in that birth plan for discussion and start your natural cervical ripening methods. Because if you make it to 37 weeks, that is full term and all the things you want to do are on the table. Um, at 39 weeks, if we know we're having a belly birth, this is where you get off the train. And then those who are waiting for baby to give the signal for labor, be patient, be patient, be patient. We like to have everyone delivered by 42 weeks. So we're looking at for first time moms scheduled uh, induction of labor at 41 weeks and five days because our inductions are not fast. We don't just admit you and pit you and put you into distress. Um, they are slow. And so we try to get this baby out over the 48 hours of course. For second time moms, 41 weeks and six days because your labors tend to be a bit faster. So remember all of this is out here. Um, I get questions all the time. Now, what, what's gonna happen at my next visit? And I send them the link to this because this tells you what should be happening at each visit it, including when you'll have your routine things. The question I have out here is what are your thoughts about the RSV vaccine? So ACOG actually has not come out formally or strongly um, about it. They've said quietly, yes, it's a vaccine. It's recommended in third trimester around the Tdap, but it hasn't been added to the official list of recommended um, of recommended vaccines during pregnancy. Um, there's no evidence against it. 
But again, it's just not one of the formal ones that's on their, their list yet. They're kind of doing a case by, like, or not, not case by case, but kind of like with COVID. They didn't come out with, you should get a COVID vaccine at this point in pregnancy. They're saying, if you want to get it, your most beneficial time is probably going to be an early third trimester to confer your most passive immunity to baby at delivery with, with breastfeeding. Good question. I like this crew. All right. I have a poll question for you since y'all have questions for me. Um, if you... If you get a headache during pregnancy, are you more likely to meditate, medicate, take a Tylenol, or evacuate, leave your house and go to the emergency room? This is the poll question. Come on, answer, answer, answer. Because the polls will be closing in four, three, two, one, boom. Okay, we have a lot of meditators on here. Um, and then we have a couple of medicators, zero judgment. I might do either one depending on what the day is and how bad the headache is. Did my kids cause it? Or my kids are leaving it. So many of you have already said, you know, I have headaches, I have nausea, I have fatigue, but I know I can't take anything because I'm pregnant. So I've just been suffering through it. False. Here is our list of common pregnancy discomforts, relief measures, and what you can take over the counter. So if you send us portal messages and say, oh my gosh, I am so constipated. I know pregnancy is so sexy. I'm so constipated. What can I do about it? The first thing I'm going to do is say, hey, have you tried more fruits and vegetables, drinking more water, try some dried fruits? You say, I've tried all those things. And I'm going to say, did you look at our list of medications that are safe over the counter? So some of them are more holistic than others. Like you'll see things like aloe tablets, which we have here um, at Full Circle. There's vitamin B complex for fatigue. Um, I think there's like rosemary or alfalfa or something for swelling down there. There's some things that are holistic. And then there are some that are just straight up Western medicine. Like if you need some preparation H because your hemorrhoids are bothering you, um, then that's a thing as well. So be sure you um, take a look at this list for whatever the problem is that these discomforts are in alphabetical order. We have the caveats on there, things that we don't recommend you take, like no Pepto-Bismol, if you're having nausea and vomiting and you can't keep food down for 24 hours, please let us know. Um, if you've exhausted everything on this list and you're still having the problem, definitely reach out to us. Um, I love it when I get messages that say, hey, Dr. A, I've tried everything on your list and I still have this. And I know they were listening on the webinar and they tried everything. And now it's time to either bring them in or look at prescription medications. So remember, this is out there. You can download it to your phone. If you're old school like me, you can print it out, and stick it on the fridge, um, because I promise you anytime you need it, it will be like two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> That's how it always is. All right, gestational diabetes, we're not going to click on this one, but please remember that it is out there because I will refer to it when I circle back and talk about gestational diabetes screening a little bit later on. Weight gain in pregnancy. Um, some of you have already talked to, we're going to click on this one. Um, some of you have talked to already and you're very concerned that you haven't gained any weight in your first trimester. It's okay. Some of you are very concerned that you gained a lot of weight in your first trimester. It's not okay. All right. So what should you be gaining in pregnancy? So it's based on what you were weighing prior to pregnancy, your height and weight. Um, give you your body mass index. And so that is how we calculate what you should be gaining to support a healthy pregnancy. There's a link here that you can click and just um, get your body mass index. Based on that, these are the recommended weight gain in pregnancy based on what stores you already have available for, for baby. Um, and you'll notice over here in this last column, the rates of weight, of weight gain are in your second and third trimester pounds per week on average. If you have twins, you can add 10 pounds to the upper limit of all of these numbers here. Um, so this is just a guideline. If you are staying active, if you are eating well, your body will do what it is supposed to do to support a healthy pregnancy. But just remember, if you are eating well, um, and we'll talk about calories in, in just a moment, and if you are staying active, and we'll talk about exercise too, then you will get um, you'll get to where you need to be. So don't stress and obsess over it. We'll let you know if there's if there's any problem with your weight gain too much or too little in terms of risk factors for pregnancy. Um, birth preferences, we're gonna click on this one too. So this is your birth plan template because at some point, at some point, um, you have to tell us how you want this to go. So there are a lot of good things on here and especially since I have so many first time mamas on here, this can seem overwhelming. Like it, there's so many options and I really like, there's so much in social media and every place and, and talking loud mouths out there about what you should be doing and shouldn't be doing. This is your birth preference because this is your birth, okay? So don't feel like you should be doing what other people are doing with theirs. You take one box per week 
and you read through it and you figure out what is salient with you, what makes sense to you. So um, there's a lot of stuff on here, things from actually we could scroll right back up a little bit. So everything from um, how you want labor to start. I want to see that that second um, the second row, actually how you want labor to start to what you want to wear in the hospital. Like if hospital gowns freak you out, don't wear the hospital gown. It's fine. That's not dangerous to not wear the hospital gown. Um, pain relief measures. So I am excited to say that um, that HCA Florida um, has just um, instituted their nitrous oxide policy. So yay, we have nitrous for labor as well. And ooh, Drum roll. Okay. They also have tubs. You can labor in disposable tubs. When I tell you they were so excited to get us, I said, I'll come over if you get me tubs. So we have a policy for laboring in the water, which is amazing for pain relief. Um, other, com other things on here, just want to point out, you can see there are things for hydration and food and positions, which essentially means if you are normal and just laboring, like we don't strap you to the bed and starve you because we want you to move around. We want baby to be an active participant in labor. We, you can labor in any position, push in any position, deliver in any position. Those things are not dangerous. My thing here is safety. Everything beyond that is physiology. Whatever you need for physiology is fine as long as it is safe. You scroll to the second page while I answer this question here. What is your relationship with the birth cottage? I have no relationship with the birth cottage. It sounds like a lovely place. It sounds quaint, but I have no relationship with them. Um, is that here in, in Jacksonville? I, I don't know them. Um, next, so you'll see some things here. Uh, our standard is delayed cord clamping, immediate skin to skin, early latch. You'll also see on here the routine medications that are offered to the newborn. Um, in your later visits, you have opportunities to ask the midwives, hey, what are these things? Do I need them? What is this for? Why are they offering me this? Is this important? Does this apply to me? Do you recommend this? Um, that's This is what prenatal visits are, are for, too. Um, Circumcision, if you have a little guy, there's information on here as well. We're going to see that on the website too. Uh, we encourage breastfeeding as well. Um, you can also put on your plan that you don't want your baby to be given pacifiers or formulas or any of, of those things. don't know if I have any twins on here today, but you have twin options too and belly birth. Um, sometimes things don't go the way that we plan and we end up with unplanned belly births. And in that case, Full Circle has um, a phenomenon known as the gentle cesarean, the family-centered birth. And it is beautiful. It is peaceful. Um, and these are some of the options uh, that are listed on here as well. So if you already know that, that, that you're going to have one, um, definitely go ahead and pick out the things that you'd like. If it's an unexpected thing, just know we will still keep you and your family at the center of that experience. So like I said, one box a week, so it's not overwhelming. While we go back to the thing that I'm going to um, answer some of these questions here. Oh, Transitions Jack's Birthing Center. Okay, that is that is a separate business. Um, Full Circle does not have a relationship with Transitions Jack's Birthing Center. Um, I am the medical director over there. Um, and uh, but that that don't that doesn't make it have a relationship with Full Circle. It's a separate business, so you'd have to reach out and contact them about any questions there. Um, next question: Is it just laboring in the tub? We can't give birth in it. No, the hospital is not. Um, uh, is not. There is not a policy for water delivery at this time, but laboring uh, in the tub is definitely uh, okay. And next question, speaking of baths, which I'm so excited about for delivery, are they safe in early pregnancy at home? I've heard hot baths are not good. So if it's like a hot tub temperature, you don't want that. But like normal temperature bath water is just fine. In fact, quite relaxing in pregnancy. So enjoy with some Epsom salts. All right, cervical ripening techniques. Um, this is how you get that baby out. So we're going to click on this because at the end, you're going to come in here and say, how, how do I end this, Dr. A? How? And so these are some things that you can start doing at 20 weeks, um, raspberry leaf tea. Um, can help tone the uterus so that when you do start having contractions on your own, now remember, these aren't things to put you into labor, but just prepare your body so that when labor starts, those contractions are more efficient and more effective. At 36 weeks, you'll see things like acupun acupuncture, acupressure, chiropractic care. There's evening primrose, breast pumps, all, all that stuff. So you can you can read just week by week things that, that we recommend as we head back to the website. Um, you will also notice that the thing that is not on this page is castor oil. And uh, you can later on ask me why, especially if you want to get in that tub, you do not want castor oil on board. Um, 
Next box we have is for first time moms and trial of labor after cesarean. These are recommendations. I used to just have these for my moms who were looking for a vaginal birth after cesarean. And so my poll question is, I know this won't apply to any of the first time moms, but do I have any moms who are going for a trial of labor after C-section? This is my poll question. And as you can see, there are only two options here. Either it's not for you or yes, and you're going to rock it. Our VBAC success rates range in the high 70s, low 80 Cents, um, which is above the national average. Cool. All right. Polls are closed. All right. We have a couple of VBAC mamas out there. Um, so the same things though, you guys are both trying to do the same thing. Avoid the C-section that you do not need. So you have to help me help you. The proper exercises, taking the um, method specific childbirth courses so that you get your head in the game about what happens when the contractions start, um, getting that baby in the right position with your squats and your chiropractor, um, getting a good doula. This is not the time to cheap out. Please don't get a baby doula who's never done this before and you're looking at her and she's looking at you and neither one of y'all know what to do to get this baby right. Talk to the midwives about who the good doulas are. Go to spinning babies. Start your acupressure and acupuncture. Avoid, like, don't get tired of being pregnant. First time mamas, the biggest regret that I get is people coming in for their VBAC and say, I was just tired of being pregnant. I asked them to induce me and I wish I hadn't done that. I should have just waited a few more days. So just wait. I know it's hard. We're going to do the testing to make sure that it's safe to wait. As long as we say that it's safe to wait, just trust your body and your providers because we want what, what you want. We want a safe, healthy um, pregnancy and delivery with as much autonomy as we can safely preserve. Next question I have here. Would you suggest, when do you suggest starting Kegels and perineal stretches to, to prevent tearing? I actually don't because those Kegels may thicken your muscles. Like you think if you do bicep curls, your muscle gets thicker. If you do Kegels, your muscles get thicker and that actually thinner muscles tear less than thicker muscles. So please do not start Kegels to try that. And if you need Kegels because you're leaking urine, that's totally different, but don't do it for that. Perineal massages, really studies show that it's better to do that while you're actually pushing and the baby is giving us some counter pressure. We all use massage oils um, during delivery, warm compresses. Our goal is to prevent tearing as well. So don't worry, we'll take care of that. Circumcision care, as I mentioned, um, we do have, uh, we do perform circumcisions here in the office when babies are up to 10 days old. The way that usually works is we'll ask you right after delivery, hey, were you planning a search for the little guy? You'll tell us yes. We'll send it to our OB coordinator who will send you a portal message message with your little guy's first appointment here with us. All right. As we go back to the presentation, the question here is, do you have a list of recommended doulas? I'm actually going to answer that a little bit later on. There's no list like here's, here's a formal, you know, piece of paper. Um, but if you like, cause we don't, you know, we can't recommend one person over another, but if you tell us like a name, we can say, oh yeah, we've worked with her. She's awesome. Or never, whatever. Um, but just, so, you know, like that's kind of our list and, and the midwives, they will definitely let you know if it's somebody great. Okay. Let's talk food. Um, Dr. Adams, I'm so worried. Why have I gained so much weight? All I have in the morning is coffee. <clears throat> is it coffee or is it this? Your salted caramel mocha madness. You see all those calories? Oh my goodness. And all the fat and all the sugar. So delicious. Did you know that pregnancy only requires an additional 300 calories per day? That's it. Not very much. It takes 10 kilocalories to maintain a pound. And the amount of weight you should be gaining in pregnancy, as we discussed before, is based on your starting body mass index. So let's say you're starting the pregnancy at 170 pounds. That requires 1,700 net calories to maintain. If your goal weight gain is 25 pounds, that's additional 250 calories for a total daily caloric intake of 1,950. You divide that between breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 650 calories per meal. And that's obviously assuming you're not burning any off, but you also cannot wash it down with a 570 calorie mocha monstrosity after that. So be careful not to drink your calories on top of your meals. 
um, nutrition facts, thing, numbers to look for, healthier choices. If you're, you know, like I have the spaghetti sauce out here and you can just see things later on when you start asking me, oh, my legs are swelling, my hands are swelling, flip some of those nutrition labels over and check out that sodium content. It is appalling how much sodium is in things these days and how much of your daily allowance it actually is. This is telling you it's 23% to have 500 milligrams. I like to see your sodium under 1500 during pregnancy. So that's actually a third of the sodium that you should have in half a cup of the spaghetti sauce here. So just remember, this is a quick guide um, to how much of each one of these things you should be taking in. How am I taking them in? With your fruits, your veggies, your whole grains, your cereal. You're not going to give your baby a nut or dairy allergy if you take those in. So enjoy. Um, for my coffee drinkers, you want to keep your caffeine at less than 200 milligrams a day. I still think 200 milligrams is a lot of caffeine. Remember, caffeine is a diuretic. So if you're going to be drinking caffeinated beverages, please use the three to one rule. Take in three times as much water as the caffeinated beverage. Next thing that's coming up as I answer this one, is it likely to get gestational diabetes if you had it before? You are more likely, and we're actually going to talk about GDM in just a moment. Herbal teas, these are our favorites in pregnancy. I mentioned raspberry leaf before. There's ginger, there's lemon, there's peppermint. For the protein people, there are some pregnancy diets out there that are telling you to cram 100 and 120 grams of protein a day. Please don't do that. You will grow an 11-pound baby, and we will both be in a pickle. Um, 70 grams is your sweet spot. It is. Don't take in less than that. You're gonna get these little scrawny underweight babies that we're worried about all the time. And don't take on too much of it because again, pregnancy only requires a certain amount to make a healthy, normal size human. 70 grams is where you want to hang your protein around every day. Um, de deli meat. Yes, you can. Um, you may have deli meat as long as you microwave it for 30 seconds. Just be sure getting all that bacteria out. It does not have to be piping hot when you eat it, but just be sure we've had that 30 minutes of exposure. Um, pat your soft cheeses, as long as they're made with pasteurized milk, they're okay. So like if you're buying it from Trader Joe's or Publix, just flip it over. If it says pasteurized milk, you're, you're good. If you're at a restaurant and you can't verify, then maybe you skip the brie for the night. Um, canned tuna, you may have three, four ounce cans per week. If you're a pescatarian and that is not enough fish for you, um, the FDA has a really nice document uh, detailing what types of fish you should be eating in larger amounts because they have high DHA, which is good for baby's brain development, which things you want to eat in moderation and which things you want to have sparingly or avoid altogether, likely because of methylmercuries. It's a two page document, uh, ever changing with the tides and so on. And so I'm not going to commit it to memory, but just know this is on the YouTube channel and you can find that later on. The question I have is, do the food aversions get better? Yes, dear, they do. Hang in there. It does get better. And what about fish oil supplements? So if you're looking for a supplement, just be sure it has DHA and 200 milligrams daily. Um, and that's all you need. Anything beyond that is just extra. Um, so what things you want to avoid? Undercooked meats and fish. If you are a foodie like me and you like your steaks medium rare, so good. Um, I'm so sorry. You will have to ruin your steaks for the next several months and have it cooked well done. My kombucha drinkers, my kimchi eaters, those are fermented beverages and, and foods. Your body treats them, the fermented stuff like alcohol. And so we don't recommend those or alcohol. Um, we just don't know what amount is, is safe. If you had a little bit in your first trimester, you're probably just fine, but we just don't continue to, to pile it on. And again, with the sodium, keeping you under 1500 milligrams per day and being kind of vigilant about that one because it will catch up with you in your third trimester when the pregnancy, the placental hormones start to make those blood pressures go up a little bit. All right, questions about food before we move into exercise? Cool. All right, exercise. It is just fine for you to continue your pre-pregnancy activity unless your pre-pregnancy activity was doing nothing. And I've talked to one or two of you already who have been very transparent. I appreciate your honesty and told me that, A, I don't do anything. I don't get up. I don't walk around. <laughs> don't, uh, that was shocking to me, but I appreciate it. Now we're going to change it. Um, you just like in the first trimester, you don't feel like doing the things that you were doing before. And that's okay. Everybody gets a pass in first trimester and second trimester, you increase your blood volume, your oxygen tensions and saturations, and you will feel more like doing those things because uh, your body will accommodate that, that physiologically. Um, so just listen to your body. If you're not the Olympic athlete that you were six weeks ago, it's okay. It, it, it comes back around. 
um, question out here is thoughts on the key ingredients in, in Splenda. Um, I say limit that in, in or outside of, of pregnancy. Um, there are no specific studies linking it to anything, um, but just it's, I feel like we're going to find out something later on. So um, anything in, in moderation is, is my answer. It's fine. I would not sweeten everything with it, but it's okay to sweeten some things with it. Um, it is, if you weren't doing anything before, I'm looking at you and you know who, who you are, it is okay to start a new regimen because a sedentary lifestyle leads to a malpositioned baby. Believe it or not, the most common reason that I do a C-section is not the baby was too big or the baby was in distress. It's that the baby's head was in there crooked. Babies need to be like this. Sometimes babies are like this, or sometimes babies are like this. And if they are, if those heads are not in exactly the right spot, we're trying for a VBAC next time for sure. Um, those of you with these cute little Fitbit watches that you're monitoring your heart rate obsessively and probably creating more anxiety for yourself, just know that your resting heart rate will go up 10 to 20 beats per minute. That is normal. That is physiologic. You're like, Dr. A, I wasn't even doing anything and my heart rate is higher than it ever was before you're pregnant, you're more pregnant than you ever were before. And that's okay. Um, that That is normal. Question that I have here, is there a dangerous heart rate while working out? It's like you're reading my mind. I'm getting ready to get to that just next. Some of you told me that your exercise is walking. And I said, we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about it right now. So if when you walk, your heart rate is in the aerobic zone, then your walking is exercise. Um, the aerobic zone is 70% of your max heart rate. Your max heart rate is 220 minus your age. So for example, if you're 30 years old, your max heart rate is 220 minus 30. So at 30 years old, you should not be exercising with your heart rate sustained over 190. See, I told you I was about to answer your question. 70% of 190 is 133. So your goal is to exercise with your heart rate between 133 and 190 for 30 minutes, three times a week. If when you are walking, your heart rate is not in that range, this is not aerobic exercise activity. This is transportation. The walking for transportation is fine, but it does not count as aerobic exercise or activity. So um, those of you who are walking, let's step up our game and get that heart rate up into the aerobic zone. What types of exercise are okay for pregnancy? If you like cardio, enjoy. Treadmill, do it. Elliptical, yes. Running, absolutely. Swimming, go for it. I love swimming, actually, because your belly is weightless and your joints just feel so liquid. Um, indoor bike, if you have a Peloton, my leaderboard name is Off My Meds 8. Please feel free to follow. I will follow back. You can track my progress and I will um, try to remain accountable. <laughs> Other exercises that are okay. If you were lifting weights before pregnancy, you can continue lifting at your pre pregnancy pregnancy level. You do not need to increase your resistance during pregnancy because your baby and your body are going to increase your, your resistance. If you were already squatting prior to, to pregnancy, you can continue squatting. Um, if you were not before, I want you to start because squatting is like one of my favorite things to get baby's heads down in that pelvis in good position. You can start with five squats a day at 20 weeks, 10 squats a day at 21 weeks, 15 squats a day at 22 weeks, and we're building all the way up to 50 squats a day. They don't all have to be at the same time. You can do 25 in the morning, 25 before you get in the bed. But if we start doing those squats, that opens up those hips, just like Pilates and yoga. Those are two of my favorite exercises for, for, for pregnancy. Yes to the Zumba. That's the question that I have out there. Absolutely to the Zumba. I love Zumba as well because rotating those hips lets that body, that baby jiggle right on down into position. Go for it. Um, any experienced instructor should uh, will be able to tell you what the pregnancy modifications are for Pilates and for yoga. Exercises that you want to be careful of or stay away from um, will be on this next slide. High intensity interval training after your first trimester. So it's not the interval, it's the intensity. So you can do the low impact version of any of these, but what we don't want to do is be bouncing up and down um, during those types of exercises that can have shearing forces on the placenta. Um, lying flat on your back for extended periods of time, like with, for example, with excessive ab work. You can do side lying abs, you can do standing abs. Uh, but just not lying on your back abs for extended periods of time. Um, hot yoga, unless you are a hot yoga instructor and somebody out there knows who I'm talking to. Um, hot yoga, if you're an instructor and are fully acclimated to that environment, you're fine. Everyone else, you're going to get dizzy and fall over and possibly fall on your belly. So we don't want that. 
Um, other exercises um, or activities you want to, um, to stay away from, scuba because of the changes in barometric pressure and decreased oxygen to you and subsequently to baby. Same thing for high altitude hiking. If you have family in Colorado, um, you may visit them, but just don't go hiking with them because the air is thinner, the oxygen is less, you will get dizzy and likely pass out. Contact sports. Please do not take up kickboxing during your pregnancy say that until later. And outdoor biking after 16 weeks is just an asterisk. Just know around 16 weeks is when your center of gravity changes. When you start turning those corners, you're not so much hitting that corner as you may be hitting that curb because you kind of misjudged how much your body leans into that curb. Um, the question I have out here is, is sleeping on your back okay? The short answer is yes. The longer answer is that's in our later frequently asked questions. All right. Any questions about exercise before we move to our next poll question? All right, cool. Gestational diabetes. Can you prevent it with diet and exercise? You have one choice to make. True or false? You can take a sip of water. Five, four, three, two, one. Polls are closed. Ooh, it's a tie. Oh my gosh. All right. So I know who knows the answer is false. It's my it's my veteran mom. Does anybody who's had a baby full circle before has seen me with this question before? The answer is false. Because the question was, can you prevent it with diet and exercise? You can manage it with diet and exercise. But let me tell you why I screen everyone universally for gestational diabetes. It is because your number one risk factor is your placenta. It is. Your placenta gives off hormones. Um, insulin is a hormone that you have circulating in your body. Your placenta gives off hormones that tells your insulin, hey, you don't have to do your job. Just call in sick to work today. Well, that would be okay, except that insulin's job is to clear your body of excess glucose. So if insulin's not doing your job, it has you have glucose circulating in your body in excess amounts. And that is literally what diabetes is, excess glucose circulating in your body. So for everything else, y'all believe, that's my hormones. I think my hormones are doing this. These are hormones. So this is not a judgment on your family history, on your weight, on your lifestyle, on what you eat. It is not. It is just how your body is reacting to hormones given off by your placenta. So having gestational diabetes, I have these skinny little twig mamas who only eat curds and whey that have gestational diabetes and we can't we can't figure it out it is just a reaction to hormones so no judgment on your lifestyle there however unless you can figure out how to do this pregnancy without a placenta i'm going to need to screen you for gestational diabetes and it is a requirement here that everybody has completed all of their screening by their 32nd week. That means if you fail the one hour, your three hour has to be done by your 32nd week. So try to finish that one hour by your 28th week, please. For my moms who say, but I never eat any sugar at all. You eat good sugars and that's okay. Don't avoid those carbs prior to the test, like your fruits and your whole grains and things along those lines, because when you do the glucose screen, if you have not been taking in carbohydrates, you will get a false positive on the test because your body will say, oh my gosh, sugar, where'd that come from? So don't do that. Just go ahead and eat as normal. Um, if the actual drink is what bothers you, like you don't love the ingredients in the drink, we have options. So the Simply Pure drink is available for sale here at Full Circle. Um, it is soy free. It is dye free. It is gluten free. It's BVO free, kosher, vegan, offensive to almost nobody. Um, you can get that. Just let us know if you plan to take something other than the drink that they offer at the lab. There are other patient driven options. Remember that little box that we didn't click on the website that said gestational diabetes screening? Those have things like the fresh test, glucorganics, and glucose tablets. So when you go to the website, you will see all of those options as well. Um, again, let us know if you plan to do something uh, other than the drink, because I think Quest is no longer taking outside drinks. We just need to write it on your lab slip. All right, preparing for birth, childbirth education classes. Many of you are seeking unmedicated births. And our recommendation for that is that you treat it like a marathon. You don't just wake up one day and decide to run 26 miles. You train for it. So these are, again, for informational purposes, not endorsing any one over the other, but this is hypnobirthing. This is Bradley method. This is um, hypnobabies. Um, and these are um, there are some amazing instructors here in the Jacksonville area who are also doulas. And so some of them will teach you stuff and then come with you to help you enact it during your labor. So this is a good jumping off point for looking for some of these childbirth education classes. In addition, um, next slide. 
and you can probably already see it, uh, breastfeeding classes, um, both hospitals uh, where we currently are and definitely where we will be at the end of the month have amazing uh, lactation consultants and they have breastfeeding classes. There will also be breastfeeding classes in the spring actually here that will be hosted by an outside group um, in the lobby at, at Full Circle too. CPR for parents. Every new parent should know CPR. And if you already knew it before for adults, it is different for children. It is different for infants. These are two links. One is for the Red Cross. One is for um, an amazing provider who is actually mobile. Like she'll come to you and do CPR classes. Um, chiropractic care. If you're already seeing a chiropractor for adjustments, fantastic. Just make sure he or she is Webster certified. That is a special pregnancy certification for the changes that your body does go through to make sure that the adjustments that they make are appropriate for what happens to your body during pregnancy. Um, poll question, how many of you are planning to work with a doula? I know some of you already knew who your doula was and I was extraordinarily impressed. I was like, my goodness, like you picked your doula before you got your positive pregnancy test. <laughs> All right, polls are closing. Oh, this makes me so happy. Look how many people are working with, with doulas. Cool. And then there are some who aren't very sure. All right. Let's talk about um, support in labor. Uh-oh. Okay. Here we go. All right. Next. Sorry, I clicked the wrong thing. All right. Doulas are for emotional and physical support. Um, doulas are not for medical advice. Like they can help you make your birth plan, your birth preference list, uh, because none of those things are like medical decisions. Like what medication should I take for my blood pressure? Should I be induced because I don't have any fluid around my baby? Those are medical decisions. Once you get into labor, doulas are there for, I would like for my birth to go like this, advocating for, for you in terms of positions to make you more comfortable, help for your baby to get into the positions that help um, him or her or them to, to come out. Again, like I said, the midwives have no shortage of opinions on who the doulas are that we've worked with who have supported our patients best. Um, your best doulas are going to be the ones who like come to your house, like, actually come to some prenatal visits with you, either virtually or in person, meet with you several times ahead of time and get your personality, come to your house when labor starts, come to the hospital with you, and they stay with you at that hospital until that baby is latched, like out and latched and breastfeeding. Um, acupuncture, uh, again, on our preparing for birth and baby come out stuff. Uh, when you come out of the bathroom here, you'll see a wall of cards. These are all people who are Webster certified or pregnancy certified. Pregnancy massage is another thing as well. A lot of places won't do it in first trimester, not because there's anything dangerous about it, but just first trimester is that iffy time that, you know, higher rates of miscarriage, they don't want to be blamed if something happens. Pregnancy massage doesn't cause that. Uh, but if you need a, a note, we have a standard okay for massage note in pregnancy that you can request from our OB coordinator as well. Um, next, breast pumps. Many of your insurances will cover breast pumps. Please do not seek out um, the third party companies that help with that because a lot of them ask for a lot of unnecessary information. We have a company that we use that's very easy for us and for you. When you come in around your anatomy ultrasound week is plenty of time. There's a QR code in the exam rooms. Scan the code. Um, they will check your insurance, send you a list of pumps that are covered. You select it. They just, they create the prescription and send it back to us. We sign it and send it off. So there's none of you asking us for a prescription, seeking out what's covered. It, they take all of the work out of this. Um, when you contract with other companies, they ask us for, you know, what your dog's name was, what size shoe you wore in the fourth grade. Like it's too much information. Just let us sign the prescription by scanning this QR code and that will help us tremendously. Um, and they will get the breast pump to you in plenty of time for you to do your nipple stem to go into labor and all that good stuff and to feed your baby afterward. Postpartum care because one day this will be over. Um, blood pressure checks for those who have any issues with blood pressure uh, during labor or after delivery. We'll see you back in the office within about a week to check your blood pressure. If you have a belly birth, we'll see you back in about two weeks for an incision check. Um, routine mental health screens, again, postpartum anxiety, postpartum depression um, are, are prevalent and we want to make sure that we are catching those early. Postpartum doulas. Remember, if doulas are for physical and emotional support, hey, when do you need that more than right after you have a baby? The motherhood space 
Um, Dr. Jill Garrett is an amazing resource in this community. She is a, just a fantastic human being. And to that end, with her work and research in postpartum, Jacksonville is one of five or six pilot cities in the nation uh, that has received a grant for this awesome program, the Motherhood Space. And y'all, this postpartum support, like this is how postpartum should be done. So this is a program that for anyone who needs support after babies, I am referring to this left and right. And then pelvic floor therapy. We have a pelvic floor nurse who comes to our office three times a week. After you have your baby, you come back for your postpartum visit, then you start your pelvic floor therapy because a lot of the issues that women have after delivery, really we could get ahead of them with some preventive care and doing some pelvic floor therapy afterward to make sure that you get back to as much of your functionality as you can from prior to. Babies change things. Um, we can minimize some of that change with the pelvic floor therapy. Frequently asked questions because someone just asked this question. Can I sleep on my back? Yes, yes you can. You can sleep on your left side, your right side, or your back. Um, if it freaks you out to sleep on your back or if you get dizzy or whatever, um, you can buy one of those wedge pillows from Amazon, stick it under one of your hips, you, you'll be fine. Um, house painting, you can paint the nursery, just be sure it's well ventilated um, and you're wearing a mask. You can take probiotics. You can also um, dye your hair, which includes your eyebrows. That was a question that I got before. That's fine as well. You can do gel nails. If you're sitting in the salon with the fumes for a while, you may want to wear a mask for that. Um, you guys are going to be pregnant over the holidays. So travel is a big deal. Car travel is fine up to 37 weeks. After 37 weeks, I don't recommend being away from from us because you might have your baby and you won't be near us. And like the whole point of this is for y'all to be near us. Um, so up to 37 weeks, car travel is just fine. Just be sure you're getting out and stretching every two hours, which you will be doing if you're drinking enough water. Skincare, you may use your benzoyl peroxide, your salicylic acid, anything topical except for items that have retinol in them. If you need a natural alternative to retinol, there is Bakuchiol, B-A-K-U-C-H-I-O-L. It's a um, it's a retinol alternative that is not dangerous in pregnancy. Um, flying is okay for my twin mamas up to 32 weeks, for my singleton mamas up to 36 weeks. Just be sure that you are wearing compression hose that fit tightly. Um, do your toe raises in your seat to make sure that you're keeping your blood circulating, drinking lots of water and getting up and going to the restroom frequently to keep that blood circulating and prevent blood clots. Question here I have is hair dye in the first trimester, any trimester, because quite honestly, like not enough of it actually gets into your system to cause any issues. And if any does get into your, your bloodstream, that's what your placenta is for. It's a filter. It keeps all that stuff away. And use of household bleach, uh, again, as long as it's a, a ventilated area and you're wearing a mask, you'll be fine. Um, no roller coasters, no water slides. You guys, are, we're getting into the cooler months, so I don't think this is my roller coaster water slide crew. <laughs> All right. Lastly, we have an update on COVID-19 and we'll fly through this pretty quickly. You guys have been awesome. Um, ACOG moved from um, supporting decision to vaccinate either way to strongly recommending it based on the New England Journal study of 35,000 pregnant women who were vaccinated in 2021. Um, manufacturers, Moderna and Pfizer are okay. We do not recommend Johnson & Johnson because it has an independent risk of blood clots as does pregnancy and we don't want those to be synergistic and increase your risk overall for blood clots. All the vaccines were approved for a single uh, booster. If you're six months past your Moderna or Pfizer, you're okay for another for another injection. If you're two months past your Johnson & Johnson, you may have another injection, but not of Johnson & Johnson because blood clots. But mixing and matching is okay. So if you're two months past a Johnson & Johnson, you can get a Moderna or a Pfizer. There's no recommendation regarding a second booster unless you have another immunocompromising condition besides pregnancy. And there's no optimal time versus getting your tetanus booster or your flu vaccines because they do work differently. If you do contract COVID, we're finally coming down off of that last spike that we had before, but we're getting into cold and flu season. And so I anticipate there may be another spike coming up. There are no formal recommendations for ivermectin, azithromycin, or Plaquenil, so we don't prescribe those. The recommendations are for vitamin D3, zinc, vitamin C in these doses, as well as beginning a low-dose baby aspirin. 
um, every every day until 36 weeks. If you contract COVID after 36 weeks, don't start the baby aspirin because it won't help quite as much for what we're trying to do, which is prevent gestational hypertension, which has been linked to COVID. Um, it will increase your, as much as it will just increase your bleeding risk at delivery. Um, supportive therapy at home. Remember we have cough, cold, sore throat, all of those things are on the website. You only need to go to the hospital if you are having trouble breathing or if you have a fever that's greater than a and one, and you can't bring it down with the recommended amount of Tylenol. We are back at um, visitation numbers uh, as we were prior to COVID in the hospital. So four visitors, and that is the same across the board at both hospitals, plus your doula who is not considered a, a visitor. She is considered part of the medical team. Um, you don't, you're not required to wear masks in the room or in labor unless you are actively positive with COVID when you're in labor. And even if you are positive, we do not uh, separate moms and babies. You're given an isolate so baby can stay in the room with you without being um exposed to the respiratory droplets in the room. All right, last poll question. What can you find on the website? Um, birth plan, safe medications, what to expect at each visit, or are you reading all the way to the end and realizing that it's everything? Awesome. You guys were fantastic. Any last minute questions for me? Thank you so much for rocking with us. Thank you so much for hanging in there to the end of this. Um, please remember the town hall next Friday. I want you to be there to ask me questions about the move to the new facility. I have lots of answers, which I think you will love. Please follow us on all the things. We are social. There's Facebook, there is Instagram, there is X, formerly known as Twitter. And of course, there is YouTube where you will be able to find this video later on. On. Um, I appreciate all of you so much and you're welcome. You're welcome are the questions out there. Um, and we do not take for granted that you can throw a rock and hit a gynecologist here in Jacksonville. So we appreciate every single time you choose Full Circle to help us grow your family. We love each and every one of you and we'll see you really soon. Mm -hmm.